Okay, we're good. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, BK, I just made you a co-host. So you should be able to turn your camera on now. Hi, friends. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. I was talking with some folks in the gallery. We actually have a pretty good uh, crowd here. Yeah, we're done. Really? Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's funny because the attendance is slow. But yeah, take a look. We got a. It'll make navigating my cart a little trickier. <laughs> you know, my colleague Madison over there uh, before we <laughs> put it up. How are we looking for registration? Um, we had twenty six people register, and I just sent a reminder email, so hopefully that brings some more people in. Um, but okay. we shall see. Yeah, I'm definitely writing some notes and thinking of any particular quotes because we wanted to mention this speech because today is the. 171st yeah. anniversary, I believe. Oh, very nice. All right. Huh. I'm trying to think Do you want me? What's up? Do you want me to open up the room? It's up to you. If you feel like we're ready. Let's let's go for it. Yeah, if somebody was talking to me, they mentioned you read uh, Clint Smith, How the Word is Passed. I knew you would be very into that. I, I, yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's awesome. That's All right. awesome. All right, right here yeah, we go. That was a good interaction. Um. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Constitution Center. We are so excited that you are here with us today. Uh, wishing everyone a wonderful Independence Week. Uh, I hope everyone had a lovely, happy, safe 4th of July. Um, and we are very excited that you are here with us today for a virtual tour of our amazing exhibit, The Civil War and Reconstruction, The Battle for Freedom and Equality. Um, do me a favor, friends, before we get started, if you want to test out that chat box for me, feel free to type in where you're tuning in from who you're tuning in with. Hello, Warren, always good to see you. How's Texas? Uh, let us know where in the world you're coming from. We would love to know. And then we've got about one minute until we get started. Mm -hmm. Let us know if you, had, if you had fireworks maybe in your neighborhood or I think the ones in my neighborhood last night went for about five hours. So it was a lot of fireworks last night. We had a little bit of a delay here in Philadelphia because there was some rain and stuff. Back oh, to okay. It's always... When you have it follow a concert, it, all, it it depends on how soon the performers get done. They get done in time. That's a good point. Yeah, <laughs> it, it really does yeah. depend on that. All right, everyone. It looks like um, we are going to go ahead and get started in just a couple of minutes or just a minute or so. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. I uh, love to see everyone telling us where they're tuning in from. I love Scranton, Pennsylvania in the house. Very nice. Welcome, Susan. Yes, I got my votes for women ornament right here, which is very exciting. Uh, love that everyone is tuning in. Hi, Elizabeth from Virginia. Very nice. Yorktown had a good celebration with fireworks. Awesome. I would expect as much, right? That's very exciting. All right, folks, we've got about mm, just a couple more seconds until we go ahead and get started. Yes, I also have my RBG action figure up here in the top too. <laughs> <Action laughs> a very figures. nerdy desk, like <laughs> posable. Yeah, like the joints, like an old GI Joe. <laughs> it does. Yeah, they can move like this. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, folks. It looks like it is about time for us to go ahead and get started. So. First, I want to welcome you all to the National Constitution Center. My name is Madison. I'm a member of the center's education team, and I am delighted to be here with you today for a virtual tour of the center's exhibit, Civil War and Reconstruction, the Battle for Freedom and Equality. Yesterday, big day, July 4th, Independence Day, um, and one of the programs that we ran at the center yesterday was a wonderful um, kind of dramatic reading slash scholarly talk about one very famous American and his famous speech uh, called What to the Slave is the 4th of July. I'm, of course, talking about the amazing Frederick Douglass. 
Um, so part of today's tour of Civil War and Reconstruction, um, Brian, who is joining me here today, is going to show you some of the amazing uh, artifacts that are kind of associated with Frederick Douglass. Um, I, surprise, surprise, am not live at the National Constitution Center, and I am not alone. I am joined by my wonderful colleague, Brian Krish, who is our senior museum educator, who is going to share with us this amazing exhibit uh, and showcase some of these amazing stories. So if you folks have questions throughout the tour, make sure you pop those into the chat. That's your best way to get your questions to Brian and myself. Um, but I will also be kind of behind the keyboard here answering questions as they arise. So without further ado, Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you for our virtual tour uh, and take it away. Well, thank you, Madison. Very exciting to be able to speak to you folks today on the 5th of July. Uh, this is actually a really exciting one, Madison, because even more than many of our other virtual programs we've had, we have a lot of friends in the gallery. As you can imagine, there's a lot of folks visiting us here in Philadelphia day after the 4th of July. This is a great day to be visiting as well. As Madison mentioned, this is an anniversary, and I will get to our friend in just a moment. Today is the 171st anniversary of one of the most famous speeches and pieces of writing of the life of Frederick Douglass. Uh, the address he gives at Corinthian Hall in Rochester, New York, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? And I'll bounce over to Mr. Douglas in just a moment, but I did want to introduce where we are. I see that we have some folks who are familiar friends of these Susan and Warren, but if anybody else uh, hasn't seen the gallery even virtually before, let me tell you a bit about what we have here. This is a space that has been open at the Constitution Center since 2019, I believe May 2019, Madison, uh, and it really tells a fantastic story from really the founding era, and I'll get back to the 1787 in a moment, uh, going through that building to crisis period, the conflict and the secession crisis, uh, the war itself, and then during the Reconstruction period, how Reconstruction transformed the United States Constitution and transformed what it means to be a citizen of the United States. That uh, Eric Toner, the historian, describes this as America's second founding, that it is as significant in developing the ideas of who is part of we the people and what those rights, privileges, immunities, and protections might be. So we got a lot of ground to cover. And I will, I wanna make sure that I get to some of the greatest hits and my favorite parts of the gallery for all of you folks here. So without further ado, we do start here with this text, Building to Crisis, 1787 to 1860. And that's a, quite a wide range. We're essentially looking at all of the period from the Constitutional Convention through to the election of 1860, because all of that period, those 73 years, we are building up to essentially the split in the country. And that split would be, of course, over the question of slavery. We are very clear, and you don't have to take my word for it. You can read any number of the secession documents published by South Carolina or Mississippi, or Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens' cornerstone speech, and many more. Uh, the building to crisis begins in 1787 because the Constitutional Convention does see compromises on the question of slavery. The word does not appear, not a once. And that is something that Frederick Douglass will end up pointing out in his 4th of July, 5th of July, really, speech. But the Constitution does have reference if you know what you're looking for. Article 1, Section 2, the three-fifths compromise. We're saying every 10 years in the census, we will count all free persons, excluding Indians not taxed, and three-fifths of all other persons. If you're not a free person, what else would you be, right? And in, later on in Article 1, it will delve into the migration or importation of such persons as the states now existing think proper to admit. I think I got the language right there. They're referring to the Atlantic slave trade and saying that the federal government could not ban that until 1808. It was one of just two things you could not amend the Constitution to do. Even in Article 5, it says that clause about the Atlantic slave trade and denying a state or removing its equal representation in the Senate without its consent. And then, you ready for this one? The third example that we'll see is in Article 4 of the Constitution. Uh, it's going to reference, it's going to say that any person held to service or labor in one state upon entering or 
it actually uses the word escaping into another state. And that language is really key. Would not be released from their service or labor, but to be delivered to whom their service or labor is owed. So these compromises are made. They are made. The word does not appear. There is no explicit right to hold property in enslaved people in the Constitution. And that is something that many abolitionists would make clear in the years to come. Uh, it does not use the word, does not give it to official approval. It just limits the federal government's authority uh, to stop the Atlantic slave trade's expansion and count the counting of enslaved people uh, in representation to sort of minimize the power of those states in which slavery uh, is more widespread. And that's really something to get into with a map behind me here. We have this American experience under slavery and a timeline of events. From the compromises that are made at the convention onward, there are a lot of transformations for our nation. And one is that there are new states added. We have uh, new territories. Uh, there are potential Northwest and Southwest territories that be could become new states, whether that be Tennessee, Kentucky, Iowa, not Iowa, not yet, Ohio, Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan. And there's the question of what would happen with them. In 1787, the Congress under the Articles of Confederation would say that slavery cannot be uh, expanded into those territories north of the Ohio River. That would be the Northwest Territory and would become Wisconsin, Michigan. Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, creating a north-south divide. But over time, more land is added to the United States, the Louisiana Purchase, the Mexican Session of Territory, including the annexation of Texas, uh, the Purchase of Florida, and more. So that more land is added, changes in farming practices and technologies like the cotton gin, and more is such that by 1860, by the eve of the Civil War, in, in case you ever heard this, slavery is not going away on it, not declining. It is in the places where it exists, growing. So take a look at the map I have here. Now, this can be a little tricky, I know, especially with the glass case, but we're looking county by county. We can see some of these here. I'm gonna pan up, because I always like to start there. Just in the Potomac River region, outside of Washington, D.C., example, Prince George County, Maryland, 56% of all living people are enslaved. And if we go to many states further south, uh, we'll see that that number only continues to grow uh, within North and South Carolina and Georgia. That we can see within South Carolina, there are counties where 85% of all living people are enslaved. In fact, and I think we have the link online somewhere, but I'll pull up my chart so we can see this here. Oh, thank you, Madison. This is the map of where, by 1860, slavery exists. Uh, most northern states in the early, by the early 1800s have taken steps. Pennsylvania is the first in 1780 to pass a gradual abolition act, not all at once. Uh, most northern states by 1804, I believe New Jersey is the last to do so. But in the southern states, that's not the case. And if anything, the percentage of population would grow. In the original census in 1790, 18% of people in the country are enslaved. By 1860, it declined to 14%. But 14% is a large number considering that there's been 70 years of immigration to the United States as well. And part of that's natural population growth. It's also the 20 year period. There are as many people brought to America enslaved between 1787 and 1808 as there were in the 60 years previous. Except that South Carolina went from 57% free in 1790 to 57% plus enslaved in 1860. South Carolina had the largest percentage of all people enslaved in 1790, 43%. We can see there are six states where there are more people enslaved than in any state when the Constitution was written. That's not really an institution that looks like it is on the decline. Yet, but and so there are attempts to really maintain balance. The Missouri Compromise, which would have set the southern border of Missouri as a dividing line between free and slave territory. Uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which would have left some of the western territory beyond the Mississippi open to popular sovereignty and the will of the people. And more. And yet this growing anti-slavery movement is pushing for them to do something or do what can be done. Uh, 
There are textbooks in 1852, the same year as the speech we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, Harry Beecher Stowe would publish Uncle Tom's Cabin, which brings in literature the evils of slavery home to many who are living in communities where slavery has been abolished for generations. Uh, it becomes the second best-selling book in the 1800s, second only to the Bible. Uh, there are other books, though, with other audiences. The abolition movement forms societies, uh, organizations here in Pennsylvania. Uh, the Pennsylvania Hall is constructed with a free labor store and auditorium, but it is burned to the ground by a mob in 1838. Other organizations are published in effect to convince not only adults, but win the hearts and minds of youth. In the case here beside me, and take a look, there's a plate that would have belonged to a child, as well as a magazine. Not quite a highlights magazine, but a The Slave's Friend, a periodical for young people, for children, to raise them to be young abolitionists. And there are some for even younger uh, would-be abolitionists. Right above that portrait of Frederick Douglass, there's an excerpt from uh, Elizabeth Townsend's uh, The Anti-Slavery Alphabet. Whether you learn your ABCs, he is the kidnapper who stole that little child or mother, freaking it clung around her. He tore them from each other. Ooh, some sobering reading, but the, the best way to combat slavery, some felt, was to prevent future generations from supporting it, to really drive home these evils. The others felt for adults, for those participating in American politics, what is the best way to take on this challenge? And how should we address? possibly observant. And this really comes into play with the speech that Frederick Douglass would deliver in 1852. And I want to just point out some contrast here. Uh, his colleague and someone with whom he would have many disagreements, William Lloyd Garrison and others feel that the Constitution is not the document that will be able to be utilized to free the millions of Americans who are enslaved. He, quote, describes it as a covenant with death in agreement with hell. Uh, and Douglas takes a very different point of view. He views that through election, through legislation, through civic action, uh, there is the potential to win over hearts and minds and to spur justice and to see to the abolition of slavery. And we can see this quote here from Frederick Douglass on the wall. Let me get close for you folks, where he says, if the South has made the Constitution a bend to the purposes of slavery, let the North now make that instrument bend to the cause of freedom and justice. Uh, he felt that the act, that the Constitution did empower people to abolish slavery, that it did have the ability, and that it was not a pro-slavery document explicitly. And this brings us to July 5th, 1852. That comes up in his speech. Uh, he would address a crowd in Rochester, New York, as I said, at Corinthian Hall on the 5th of July, the day after. And he remarks on the celebration, especially by those abolitionists, those support, would be supporters potentially of equality or at least of, for justice of the enslaved, and points out that he could not share in those celebrations, that to him they ring hollow. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? And he says, to him, your celebration is a sham. He goes on and will say that your shouts of liberty and equality are hollow mockery uh, and highlights that until all are free to celebrate fourth of july is more than any other day a day that reveals to the american slave the gross injustices and cruelty to which he is the constant victim from there however douglas also he attacks the domestic slave trade which uh, continues to as we see from that quote from the anti-slavery alphabet tear apart family uh, yes, we abolished in 1808, in theory, legally, the Atlantic slave trade, although there are many accounts of this continuing as late as 1859 of vessels smuggling enslaved people into the United States. But uh, Douglas would say, uh, would say that this is the most pernicious evil, that nowhere in the world we would see uh, something of this status, of the auctions where mother and child are separated as in the United States. But he also, in this speech, recognizes the capacity to make it. Uh, and in fact, uh, would do so saying it can be done through the Constitution. He argues and he says that it is a glorious liberty document 
And so it is a call to action. It's a reprimand a bit for those who spent their 4th of July celebrating their freedom while so many others are denied. But the 4th, that 5th, 4th of July speech, which takes place on the 5th, is also a call to action that the work is yet to be done. And many folks try to take action to abolish slavery, to challenge the institution, or to secure their own freedom. And probably the most famous uh, case that would come before the Supreme Court, certainly in the 19th century or one of them, and maybe the most infamous, would be the case involving Dred and Harriet Scott. And I wanted to include their story here uh, as a bit of a background for the case, because maybe we know the Dred Scott decision or we hear about the Dred Scott decision, but Dred and Harriet Scott and their daughters uh, had been enslaved, or the Scots had been enslaved in Missouri, transported to the Minnesota Territory near Fort Snelling, uh, following the death of a Dr. Emerson, the enslaver, uh, they would have presumably been compelled to return south. They had been transported with him to be compelled to return south to Missouri as property, essentially to be divided up among next of kin or potentially sold uh, to bring income to any of those who would stand to inherit. The Scots opposed they argue that they have lived in a territory which, according to the Missouri Compromise, uh, should have been free forever, uh, and that taking them there and keeping them there was unconstitutional uh, or violated the right that they had been married, and in the, the procession of their ceremony and their marriage was more consistent with what would have occurred for free people, and even that their daughters were born in free territory. Uh, born one on a riverboat between Iowa and Illinois. And all of these, they felt, were strong arguments that for them, they were free people and ought to be recognized as free individuals. That is not the case in the viewpoint of Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roger Taney. And he would rule against the Scots, say that they are still and would remain enslaved, that even if they were free, uh, they could not be citizens. They had no legal standing to bring a case, and they had no right that a white man was bound to respect. And even beyond that, he feels that these federal restrictions on the expansion of slavery themselves are unconstitutional. He's hoping to really settle this national question, but it, it doesn't. And in fact, really only inflames the national divide further. Even among the members of the court, Justice Benjamin Curtis, my opinion is that every free person born on the soil of a state is a citizen of that state and of the United States. Justice Curtis's opinion is, I think we can agree, much closer to the conception of citizenship that we see today. Now, it is against the backdrop of this and of the Dred Scott decision of the growing abolition movement of a new and upstart Republican party more committed to limiting the expansion of slavery westward and of events like John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry is threatened to, threatening to seize a federal arsenal to arm a rebellion of enslaved people so they might fight for their own freedom. All of this uh, culminates uh, in the election of Abraham Lincoln. And we have a portrait here by David Bustle Bowser, a Philadelphia-based artist and African-American man, and this really wonderful image of President Lincoln that he would have created. Uh, a little background on Abraham Lincoln in case we need it. He served one term in Congress in the 1840s, 1847 to 49, but had been out of politics for essentially a decade. He comes and rises to fame, a more well-known national status, following a series of debates with Stephen Douglas, the, the senator of Illinois, who was a key proponent of the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the notion of popular sovereignty. And Lincoln and Douglas have, as you may have heard, a series of debates about the implications of the Dred Scott decision, of the ability of the federal government to restrict the expansion of slavery. What is the best course of action to avert crisis? Lincoln does not win that election in 1858, but the two of them are candidates for president in 1860, along with a uh, couple of other candidates. Lincoln ultimately wins the election, wins the majority of the electoral college vote. He receives about 40% of the reported popular vote. And we see the secession crisis begin. And I'll delve into that in a moment. But I wanted to show you folks some of the items. So when we're going through the exhibit, I love the feature, what we've got here. Uh, we have for this candidate Lincoln, in the case, 
the cast of his hand that was taken following receiving the Republican nomination in 1860. Abe is holding a portion of a broomstick in his right hand because he had shaken so many hands that it said that he was trembling and could not stay still for the artist. In the case beside, we notice that he doesn't have the beard until he's campaigning for an elected president. This is a clean shave and age, a little bit different of a look. This ribbon here that would have been worn by somebody uh, who was supporting him and his running mate and his first vice president, Hannibal Hamlin. Uh, and uh, besides that, in the case, we'll get into what happens after his election. Well, this sets off, as I mentioned, the succession crisis. Uh, by the time Lincoln raises a portion of an American flag, and where he raises the full flag, we have a portion of it here, on Washington's birthday, 1861, February 22nd, two weeks before he's to take office, Seven states have already announced their secession. By December of 1860, South Carolina has already announced its intention to leave the United States. We also have in the case beside here an account talking about Mr. Lincoln's visit, someone's personal description, among other things. We see February 1861, someone saying the street to the route to the parade were jammed as full of people as they could be, all anxious to see the man who is to be our next president. And there are, there are photographs of that. There's also, the group would have been reproduced in newspapers at the time. Let's see if I can get a good look at this here for you folks. There's an engraving of Mr. Lincoln. You can see him there raising the flag uh, above with a the crowd. There's folks in the trees beside the belt fence. It's a whole, many, many folks gathered to see this incoming president elect. Now, what are these states proceeding for? So they're not waiting to see Lincoln inaugurated as president. Well, Lincoln does not believe that he has the authority to abolish slavery everywhere. He wants to prevent its expansion westward. Um, and would, as late as 18 September of 1862, uh, write to some folks expressing that, saying that if he could save the Union while some remained enslaved, he would do that. If he could save the Union while with, by freeing everyone, he would do so. If he could save the Union long, without freeing anyone additionally, he would do that as well. I uh, know I didn't get that quote in the right order for you folks. But the initial uh, cause is to keep the Union together. That is not necessarily the case for the Southern. So their declarations of secession are very explicit, including this is the second sentence of the Mississippi Declaration of Secession. Our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery the greatest material interest of the world. Mississippi is not alone. South Carolina in its declaration of secession calls out specific Northern states for violating Article Four of the Constitution, that fugitive slave clause for not participating or not cooperating in the return of property that has escaped or entered into another state. Uh, in fact, South Carolina in its declaration of secession also quotes Abraham Lincoln in his famous House Divided speech that this nation could not endure half slave and half free as one of the right reasons for being distrustful of him as president and essentially not wanting to be a part of a union in which he was the chief executive. Now, as the war goes on, however, the motivations, the cause become clear. And in fact, many folks are swayed, especially because the Confederate commitment and their statements are so explicit about preserving slavery that if we were to preserve the union, slavery must die, that this institution must be destroyed. And Lincoln, by late 1862, recognizes that himself. And we have a copy here. This is a, a pretty local one for us in Philadelphia of the Emancipation Proclamation. This is one that Lincoln would have signed himself on June 6, 1864, uh, this proclamation. Now, he issues it, he announces it, and we'll see if I get a good look at the text here for you folks. He announces that this Emancipation Proclamation on September 22nd, 1862, 100 days before the new year, and saying that, we see here, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of the state where the people shall be in rebellion against the United States shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. Uh, he's giving the Southern states 100 days to end the rebellion, or on New Year's Day, he will issue this proclamation. And we are the Constitution Center. I love that Abe is very specific in citing the Constitution. I, therefore, Abraham Lincoln, this is by New Year's Day, what he, the statement he makes. Link, I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, 
by virtue of the power in me vested as commander in chief of the army and navy in a time of actual armed rebellion against the authority of the government of the United States and as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing a rebellion. And he says, would announce this and say that all these folks, and he would spell out where it applies, is very specific. Certain parishes in Louisiana are exempted, counties in Virginia, the all of the counties, the 48 designated as West Virginia, for example, which was not yet its own state. But one of the other keys of the Emancipation Proclamation is this line here. I declare and make known such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service forces of the United States and would open up military service to free black men. And this proclamation would, by its text, help to free more black men and help to lead to more enlistment and more folks to join the Union Army. And tens of thousands, I believe around 200,000 actually, would join the cause. Now, this would then change the question of, okay, with the freedom secured, as, as the war comes to an end, what exactly will the new nation look like? And I want to make sure that I get to once we have our reconstruction exhibit. And I apologize if I swing by our immense collection in this case, most of them from the Gettysburg Foundation or the Philadelphia Civil War, the Civil War Museum of Philadelphia's collection. Uh, a lot of wonderful artifacts, some of them personal items, even a piece of hard pack that survives from soldiers' rations of the day. But as the war ends, as we see the, at the Emancipation Proclamation in place, there's this question of what happens now. And I think this is a great quote along the wall. I know I mentioned it to some folks yesterday. There's a quote from Thaddeus Stevens, Congress member from Pennsylvania. Uh, it's a great reference to the Declaration of Independence on this day after independence. Uh, he says, our fathers had been compelled to postpone the principles of their great declaration and, and, sorry about that, and wait for their full establishment until a more propitious time. That time ought to be present now. So saying reconstruction, he sees, remember that language of a second founding, that Stevens and others are seeing this opportunity as a way, this, as an opportunity to remake the Constitution and honestly to live up to the values of the declaration. This great founding document, the principle that all men are created equal, that all folks are guaranteed the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and for the pursuit of happiness, but for the entirety of our history, that has not been the case. And so Reconstruction is recognized as an opportunity to, to make rights, to reform, uh, and remake the Constitution. For the first time in generations, it had been 60 years. By the end of the war, 61 years since an amendment to the Constitution. And in early 1865, there is the 13th Amendment submitted to the state, passed by Congress. And it would be one that says that, let's see, let me take a look for this for you folks. We have this original here with Secretary of State William Seward's signature on it. And we'll have the provisions sent to the state. But there we go, Article 13 at the bottom. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime. And that's the next page there it gets into. There you go. Yeah. First of version, see if I can read this handwriting. Punishment for a crime uh, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Congress saw the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. February 1st, 1865. So this amendment is submitted to the state in February 1865, shortly before the end of the war. We do have a reference in here of, is there a loophole in the 13th Amendment? And many would say that except as punishment for a crime, because in the years to come and in the decades to come, that clause is often, was often exploited uh, to sentence folks to labor, to labor, employing convict leasing, uh, coming up with a number of uh, curfews, other strict regulations or restrictions on uh, labor opportunities, uh, movement of, for free black men and women, in many ways to see them as convicted, tried, and sentenced potentially to labor and maintaining what is sometimes called slavery in all but name. Intervening between when the amendment is submitted to the state and when the amendment is ratified, 
behind these folks here taking a look at. We have a case talking about the assassination of President Lincoln. Uh, on April 14, 1865, Lincoln is seeing our American cousin. There's a playbill in the case uh, in front of those folks there. And he is taught by John Wilkes Booth, uh, less, honestly, a lesser known brother of a well known acting family. His brother Edwin was, until April 14, 1865, the more well known member of the family. And with that, we see this death of the president. There have been deaths of a president before, but never an assassination. Uh, and this would elevate to the presidency one Andrew Johnson. Despite that banner, that ribbon we've seen earlier supporting the candidacy of Lincoln uh, of, and Hannibal Hamlin, Hannibal Hamlin is not the vice president for Lincoln's second term. It is Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, the only senator from a southern state that would join the Confederacy, who himself did not join the Confederate government, support the Confederate cause. That said, even if he was not a secessionist, Andrew Johnson is a, still an, a valid supporter of white supremacy, giving quotes about this is a white man's country, being opposed to uh, the actual equality and the ability to vote, uh, as well as to any sort of uh, political, economic, social equality, uh, even vetoing civil rights acts of the era. Uh, in that time and in the immediate aftermath, it is clear to many that there is more that is needed than just the abolition of slavery. There's a wonderful quote here along the wall. Uh, I love featuring this. It's a, a great document if you can find it. It's a statement. Oh, there you go. The Address of the Colored Citizens of Norfolk, Virginia. This is actually a group that had attempted to vote in the spring elections in Virginia in 1865, and not long after the surrender of Robert E. Lee and an army of Northern Virginia. They are denied the right to vote, would end up drafting this resolution, holding a convention. That, and it, the statement begins, fellow citizens. And beyond that, it lists what else needs to be done and how they still feel that uh, it is incomplete securing their equality if they are, as they state, citizens of the United States. And mentioning how it is a crime for them to be taught to read, the children are doomed to ignorance, we are defenseless before our enemies. Because in many states, a series of black codes had been developed that would restrict movement, uh, educational opportunities, employment opportunities, and much more. And so we have a, a, a question here of why did we need the 14th Amendment? It's really to security. And we have some wonderful features where you can see all of the text of these Reconstruction Amendments in this gallery. And we do have our 14th Amendment here, an original signed one. I want to make sure that I get a little bit further get you both a look at the text of the amendment itself. So the 14th covers a lot of ground. There was a joint committee on reconstruction from December of 1865 to May of 1866. Uh, this committee would eventually come up, would look into what more can be done, what more needs to be done uh, to really secure these gains or to actually reform, remake, to reconstruct the South following uh, the abolition of slavery. And so the first and key portion, the most cited part of the whole Constitution uh, in federal cases, is our 14th Amendment, Section 1. All persons born and naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, whoop, I went way too close, zoomed in there, are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. This is overturning that Dred Scott decision by saying that all persons born in the United States are citizens, establishing birthright citizenship. Um, and also, you notice saying that those who would have emigrated, become naturalized citizens, have a same class of citizenship, the same rights, the same privileges and immunity. Uh, they would also say that states cannot deny people due process or equal protection of the law. In another key portion, no state, nor shall any state. You read the First Amendment to the Constitution. It says Congress shall make no law, it's restricting the federal government. And cases decided earlier in the 19th century had essentially said this would apply to the federal government. The 14th would say it would provide for the incorporation of the Bill of Rights to secure that the, our state and local governments likewise cannot deny to us our constitutional freedom. And these have become supremely influential uh, in countless civil rights decisions over the following decades, over the next really 160 years. But even then, 
there is cause for more states. The 14th Amendment does not, for one, secure the right to vote. And there's another quote here from that same address of the citizens of Norfolk, colored citizens of Norfolk, Virginia, give us suffrage and you may rely upon us to secure justice for ourselves. That if we do not have a voice in those who are in power making and enforcing them, that's the 14th Amendment says that Congress shall enforce this with appropriate legislation or the 13th Amendment, and yet you have no vote for members of Congress this could, you know, these could be a, a paper, a parchment barrier. This could be a promise with little in the way of enforcing it. And the way to really secure that would be through access to the ballot, the right to vote. The 14th Amendment in Section 2 said states could not count male citizens over 21 who were denied the right to vote except for crimes committed or participation in rebellion. But this really opens this up more. It says that the right to vote cannot be denied on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. I want to note, by the way, for those of our friends who take, who've taken part in our programs on the 19th Amendment, uh, the suffrage movement at this time is divided on these amendments. Uh, some, like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, are opposed to these amendments, which include the word male for the first time, which make it acceptable to deny the right to vote to women, which would say that. The right to vote cannot be denied because of race, but because it's not an affirmative right to vote, it does not say everyone can vote. It leaves open the possibility of other reasons someone can be denied, including their gender. Still, other suffragists, like we have Lucy Stone on the panel below here, uh, pictured beside Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, she and others would support these amendments. Uh, others like uh, uh, Francis Ellen Watson Harper would deliver a speech called We Are All Bound Up Together. Uh, we Are Bound Up Together. This essentially says the urgency to need of being a cohesive movement and supporting the, the right for all. To not argue that you should have the right to vote before others, but to continuously work for all. And uh, Harper and others who formed the American Equal Rights Association to pursue all of the freedom and suffered for all. Now, I want to point out, and I realize, ha Madison, we're probably just running a little nearer to our end, that Reconstruction as it exists for a period is tremendously successful in creating a representative government that's truly representative of the people who live there uh, more than at any point in our nation's history before. Uh, it is still essentially entirely male suffrage, but there are, we have an office holders by the numbers interactive here, uh, thousands of black men elected to public offices around the former Confederacy. There are many who are elected to the U.S. House of Representatives or to the Senate. Hiram Revels, we can see to the left there. Uh, beside him, Robert Small is elected to the House of Representatives. Blanche Bruce is also elected to the Senate. And that this is its own Period. But it is unfortunately short lived. And we'll see a bit the feature there. Let's right, pan around. Folks are looking at a uh, robe there. Organizations like the Red Shirt, White League, the Ku Klux Klan, and more would organize against uh, free black men, elected officials, allies involved in registering voters, organizing campaigns, providing equal employment, economic opportunities and much more. Uh, and as local elections or victories are won by those who would want to be essentially to restore the old South, uh, they use certain work terms to describe themselves like redeemers. Uh, they are able to institute a number of restrictions and exploit loopholes in these amendments. Those loopholes about excessive punishment for a crime in the 13th Amendment, or that the 15th Amendment does not say that the right to vote cannot be denied for other reasons. Uh, in the case here, we can see there are poll tax receipts from Texas from 1923. They are for $1.75 one would have to pay to vote. It's about $27 today. It is not a huge, simply sum of money, but it is enough to discourage many from voting. And many states would have clauses, grandfather clauses, for example, uh, that would say who is exempt if your grandfather could vote you do not have to pay the poll tax. Well, whose grandfathers were not deemed able to be citizens by the Supreme Court. 
And so this could, I, this could have an asymmetrical effect on who can cast a ballot in the United States. Others would have clauses that say, if you served in the military, you can vote. Who, as a result of how, for example, being enslaved, did not serve in the military during the war. If someone were freed, let's say, in June of 1865 on Juneteenth, that would have been at the conclusion of the conflict. And you might have to pay the poll tax, but your neighbors who were, or others in the community who was fought, and I'm borrowing the language from the Oklahoma Constitution at the time, says Union and Confederate and later Spanish American war veterans do not have to pay the poll tax. So there's a long history of successes and challenges faced with reconstruction, a different speech than in that 4th of July speech by Frederick Douglass. There's an address he gives at the Republican National Convention in 1860, uh, 1876, uh, and really challenging the party, which had won multiple elections in a row, uh, saying that you have emancipated us and I thank you for it, but what is your emancipation? And concluding, you have turned us loose for the wrath of our, our infuriated masses. He says to the audience that do you intend to enforce the provisions of the Constitution, that you have made these great things, and you have remade our Constitution and written it even further to be, as he said, that glorious liberty document, but it would still take continuous effort to enforce it, to secure those blessings of liberty, and the and uh, for ourselves and our posterity. In the years to come, a series of court decisions would uh, weaken the uh, efforts to enforce the prohibit of the Reconstruction Amendment. Uh, some of these, like Minor versus Happerset, uh, would say that yes, women are citizens, but they cannot vote. Crookshanks versus United States uh, leaves prosecution of organizations and individuals like the plan up to state and local government rather than federal government that it says no state shall deprive. We give the federal government the power to stop state and local government from discriminating against their fellow citizens, but not individuals. That comes into play more in the civil rights cases and beyond. And eventually, of course, with the Plessy versus Ferguson decision, it can say that racial segregation, even in public accommodations and in public facilities, is permissible. And we see for the next 60 years, the rise of Jim Crow until the civil rights, movement, which is really where our exhibit concludes and sees how that, that was not just a step towards securing freedom, new freedoms for Americans, but ensuring that those which had been written generations earlier were enforced to ensure that, as the declaration would say, all men who are created equal are truly treated so. Now, you know, I've gone on for quite a while, Madison. I don't think I have any particular quotes. Oh, uh, someone was looking for a quote. Every man, each man having voted, it walked away several inches taller. Now I'm trying to find where in the exhibit that would be. I'm looking it up too now, Brian. I, I'll, I'll let you know if I beat you to it. Of course. So, uh, Julia Wilbur, 1867. Thank you for pointing that out. Some of these things are like, I know the quote's in here, but I like, hadn't seen almost couldn't remember what it was. Each man, Julia Wilbur, 1867. And on the other wall, I feel like I had, I missed this one from uh, Representative uh, Robert Smalls uh, in the case above that poll tax. Let me see here. My race needs no special defense for the past history of them in this country proves them to be uh, equal of any people anywhere. All they need is an equal chance in the battle of life. And succeeding generations have continued to, to work to that end and to work, work for that effort as representative falls in the Oh, God. So what do you think, Madison? I know it's the 5th of July. There's a lot of on our minds. It's always a great time to converse about these things. It is. I I'm looking at Brian in the in the chat. Um, Susan has another good question about if the exhibit features any literacy tests. I don't think currently we have one, right? No, I, I don't think so. they... I, we have we have pulled we have the poll tax example of not literacy test. The one that stands out to me, but I think I've seen this actually um, the national. But could I imagine that being one of the questions upon which my right to vote was contingent? And that's an example that often some of them would have folks have to read and write or copy 
uh, portions of their state constitution, uh, would have to name their elected, who their incumbent elected officials were before. That's always the one that stands out to me is asking where are the U.S. mints located? And I'm thinking, how could that possibly be relevant to whether or not someone should be permitted to vote? I'm also going to pop in the chat because I remember Slate published something um, and it was from the Louisiana voter literacy test and they called it like the impossible literacy test. I'm going to pop that in the link too because wonder, some of the it's it's kind of mind blowing just how ridiculous these questions are. Um, you can check out that second link in there, but you know it's it's like word word games and puzzles that they include. So you know I popped that in the second link, but um, you can check it out from the state of Louisiana that was distributed to voters um, for the voter literacy test, and it's kind of ridiculous. Um, it's very very difficult to to kind of wrap your mind around some of those questions. So definitely check that out. Hmm. Yeah, it's pretty uh pretty thorough questionnaire there. Yeah. It does make does make one wonder. I just took a look at that yourself. Why would they need to know if you were a clergy member uh on your registration? Exactly. And <laughs> and like that's and one of the other things too with like the Louisiana one, it's you know, listen to some of these questions. Number 20, spell backwards, forwards what <laughs> you know print the word vote upside down but in the correct order that has me what? wondering do you literally write the letters in the word um forwards or do you literally just write the word backwards as you know i know word? it's very <laughs> tough i mean yeah. it's it's you can see where the confusion set in absolutely yeah um and i some of the um, ones i wonder if they got increasingly obtuse yep Brian, you I, I just saw Susan's question about the, the Equal Justice Initiative. You've been there. Yeah, you? yeah. I have. That's a really fantastic um, exhibit gallery. And I, I remember seeing that, that uh, I don't know if I've seen that one, but. That's ridiculous. How many yeah. bubbles are in a bar of soap? Yikes. Yeah, I know. Some of our staff, uh, I think in 2019, have visited uh, the, uh, the Legacy Museum and the, the Memorial for Peace and Justice. I had gone to a speak, speak with the uh, one of the folks at the leg at Equal Justice Initiative, uh, and also we visited Selma, of course, on the way, which is where I, I remember seeing they had a National Park Service operate the site and had a feature on the uh, poll taxes that were used at the time uh, there in Mon in Alabama as well as elsewhere. Yeah, I, I it's on my list of places to visit, but I just I it's. It's a, it's quite an important story that needs to be told and those mm -hmm. monuments that they have, uh, a very important part of the nation's history and a very timely way to wrap up our time in our Civil yeah. War and Reconstruction exhibit. So some homework for you all is to go <laughs> check out the Equal Justice Initiative because they're doing oh, yeah. incredible work. Absolutely. All well, right, I don't see any other questions. Um, Brian, did you want to close us out? Sure. I just want to thank you folks again for joining. And I know it's a busy week on the fourth week of the 4th of July. There are a lot of things that you could be doing, and I'm aware of that. And we truly appreciate it. And I can tell you that is very much in the spirit of the day that the 4th of July throughout our history, many have seen it as the opportunity to for uh, education or to take action. And certainly this is a date 171 years ago in which Frederick Douglass had that same idea. Uh, so thank you folks for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. And if we don't see you, I think we have uh, a couple months off from our Wednesday virtual tour, don't we, Madison? That is correct. Um, this is our last uh, virtual tour of Civil War and Reconstruction for a little bit. We're going to take the next couple months off. Um, but a huge thank you to uh, TD Bank for sponsoring these monthly tours of uh, Civil War and Reconstruction. But we will see you again in October, probably sooner, because keep an eye out for emails from myself uh, and the rest of the education team about ways to celebrate Constitution Day, yeah. which is just in a couple months. So very I, exciting I, stuff coming around the corner at the NCC, and we are so grateful for your continued support. And so I have a feeling you'll be seeing a lot of us around Constitution Day. Thank you folks so much. Yes, you will. Bye, everyone. Bye.